I'm educational director for the Kansas City Drawdown Society and uh, my presentation today I think you'll really enjoy and there's a, a button at the bottom of your screen that says uh, Q&A so if you uh, click on that you can uh, put your questions there and I've uh, left plenty of time at the end for um, answering those questions that you have. So now I'll get started. And uh, this is a uh, local group in Kansas City, one of the th three drawdown groups. And our mission is to get the word out on climate solutions and um, help people realize that reversing global warming is possible. And this started in uh, 2018, soon after the uh, Project Drawdown released the uh, Drawdown book, which is uh, published by Penguin, and uh, edited by Paul Hawken. And I had heard Paul Hawken speak, and I was really interested, but it wasn't until I read the Drawdown book that I got really excited and decided this is what I want to uh, put my efforts to and spend my time doing. And one of the things that really changed for me is I had not been working on climate solutions because it just seemed such a big thing that nothing I could do would make a difference. And uh, really thought that, well, I hope people figure that out. And finding out that, you know, if we scale up the solutions that are already out there, that we can uh, have that first point where we are sequestering, taking out more CO2 from the atmosphere than we're putting up by 2045. That really got me energized, and it was like a moment for me of what's next. So, um, as uh, people I work with in Kansas City and I've worked with and talked with people who are working on these climate solutions all across the country and actually all over the world, talk to people in Sweden and Japan and Australia, Canada, and uh, it has been interesting for me to look back and see where the efforts have been most successful and uh, what the secrets for those successes were. So today I'm going to talk about probably the tip of the iceberg, just the ones I know personally that have been climate initiatives that have been supercharged. And once I give you a sense of those, then we'll go into the, the keys for their success or the secret sauces. So uh, first one on my list is the uh, kitchen worm compost bins. And um, this is not a compost bin that gardeners use that has the layers and the trays and the spigot at the bottom that you keep in the backyard. This is a way to do uh, composting in your kitchen, self-contained, very easy, uh, no bad smells, and be able to take your food scraps and compost them instead of putting them in the garbage because the food scraps that go into the landfill are anaerobic and they produce methane which is 25 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2 and in the first few years even more than that. And then you're also producing absolutely solid gold compost. There's no better compost than vermiculture. And so when that compost is put on the soil, whether it's flower bed or for vegetables or lawn, um, the soil is energized and actually pulls more carbon out of the atmosphere. 
So it's a double win. And I've uh, got two grants. This team um, prototyped, got two grants, and there actually are more than 100 kitchens now in the Kansas City area that uh, have kitchen worm compost bins. And this was one that um, in the early stages, people said that it would never work. People would never want worms in their kitchens. <laughs> and now I have friends that when they go on vacation, I worm sit for them and they bring their colony of worms over in their worm bin. And I keep them fed and watered and in good shape until they get back because they love their worms. Um, the next is re reusable lunch trays. And this uh, team uh, took on uh, the problem of one of the schools in Kansas City was actually using styrofoam lunch trays. And of course, you know, they're putting brand new ones out every day and throwing them all away every day. And so they were able to get a grant to buy enough reusable lunch trays for the school to no longer use the styrofoam. And so all of the uh, greenhouse gases associated with all of that production of styrofoam uh, for that school was avoided. And uh, that was a case where, um, you know, one person started it and it was like too big. And so that team really made a difference on that effort. Uh, the next is uh, planting trees. And this is a, a group called the Earth Savers. And uh, they, they found some land where they could plant trees and decided instead of little saplings that they wanted to do larger saplings and that would have to be transported in a truck. And uh, it was much more than a family could uh, take care of, but they got the call out, everyone was a yes, and uh, got all of those planted in a day. Um, the next one is the uh, Net Zero House Tours. And uh, again, uh, there's so much that's important to do as individuals. And so uh, this uh, Kansas City engineer uh, was able to get a net zero house built on Lake Wacomas. But to really supercharge that, uh, he created a presentation and worked with a team to get tours arranged so that people could come through and see that, yes, it's possible to do a net zero house, and it looks like a regular nice house. <laughs> and um, you save so much money. And here's how it's done. And as an engineer, he could really talk about all the nitty gritty of, of how that house reached net zero. And uh, the next is uh, plant-based potlucks. And this just uh, started out very small uh, in the Kansas City area. And one of the um, really uh, impactful climate solutions is a plant-rich diet. And so uh, as we we're meeting in people's houses in Kansas City, it was really nice to start with a potluck. And um, because people are uh, really more aware of uh, how important plant-based diets are. I think the first time a few people brought a, a plant-based dish to share. And from then on, it became the challenge to, you know, bring something for the plant-based potluck. <laughs> and it ended up with people just coming up with the most delicious, creative uh, food to bring to the plant-based potluck. And it very quickly became the new normal. And people shared recipes, and uh, it was uh, a tremendous support for that solution. Um, next, Heartland Drawdown, one of the three drawdown uh, groups in the metro area, um, worked with a team to get uh, elected officials at all the municipalities 
Raytown, Blue Springs, both Missouri and Kansas side, to a workshop talking about climate resilience. Because uh, the cities and municipalities are the ones that are going to see a lot of the climate disruption, whether it be floods or droughts or heat waves. And, and now it's the point where people will come to them and say, well, you knew this was going to happen. And what did you do to prepare? And what are you doing to lower your carbon footprint and to work on these solutions? So this was a very, very receptive group. And there were over 100 people showed up. And some of those people started giving presentations on climate solutions. It was um, just more than anybody uh, could ever imagine. And uh, again, it was you know the team getting the word out and uh, people helping with the space and uh, has been and you know documented, photographed, and uh, has made the news nationally. Uh, Cultivate KC uh, is a great organization in town that uh, found a way to get a team together and pull together a network with all of the regenerative agricultural um, entities, whether it's a greenhouse or a farmer or a researcher, and pulling everyone together uh, for uh, an annual conference to share what people are learning, do workshops and presentations, and um, reminding people that their work not only produces healthy food, but also is part of the solution for reversing global warming. And it's also a fun event. Uh, the next is uh, Carbon Footprint Eating. And this came about during uh, the pandemic when everything was shut down and it was not possible to meet in person. And I know a lot of people that have been working very hard on climate solutions. Boy, I'll tell you, when the lockdowns came and the pandemic came, er everything seemed to stop. And it's like, well, you know, we're, we're stuck in our houses. So this team um, got together and built a website to help and encourage people who are know that uh, reducing meat eating a plant-based diet is a big way that they can reduce their carbon footprint but still haven't figured out how to do that and are still on a regular uh, American meat-based diet and give them the tools and the encouragement that they need to try a plant-based diet. And uh, the team put out a challenge for a meatless month for Mother Earth and uh, gave people a lot of choices to just how far they wanted to go. They could go all the way to vegan or vegetarian, with or without dairy and eggs. They could um, do flexitarian and still eat meat occasionally. They could do planetarian and just uh, reduce their meat intake. And uh, it was very successful, not only in Kansas City, but since it was online, uh, there were people all over the country. And had uh, so far, over 60 people have gone through the challenge. And uh, once someone tries a plant-based diet for a month, um, then they know it's possible. And uh, already have a, a great, tool to help reduce your carbon footprint. Um, the next one was uh, is Maryland Native Tree Planting Effort. And uh, this is really amazing. And I know some of the people that are working on that. And this was uh, an instance of a team really pulling in everybody they could think about. So you've got uh, a network of uh, landscapers that are uh, bringing in native plants and church groups and the county and uh, just all kinds of uh, different people, homeowners 
and getting everyone together and building a map of where there are uh, native plantings in the area and uh, they have a goal for 2021 to have over 2,000 new native plantings installed in Maryland and they are well on their way just doing amazing things uh, next is the Toronto Food Waste Project and um, this was uh, started by the uh, Toronto Drawdown Group and they just did the most amazing media presentations. They had tips and tricks for people to learn how to get a handle on their food waste, they had presentations. They had almost daily Instagram pictures, uh, great social media presence, and a, a really big team to uh, pull everything off and uh, did a whole month for getting a handle on food waste and a lot of participation. Uh, the next is Rotary Clubs. And, and this is like unbelievable. And this started with a drawdown group going to one Rotary Club and saying, could we do an hour presentation? We've got something really exciting there, our climate solutions uh, that we can start working on now and actually reverse global warming. So from that initial presentation, uh, that Rotary Club not only decided, well, we have the resources and the hands on deck to actually get to work on, on one of these climate solutions, <clears throat> but they uh, were successful enough that they went to uh, the National and said, you know, we ought to roll this out to all the Rotary Clubs. And so every Rotary Club in uh, the nation is choosing someone to be in charge of their uh, climate solution efforts. And so they have a, a lot of resources to put toward that. And in many cities now, they have uh, organized projects and have uh, teams and volunteers for getting the refrigerants out of old refrigerators and air conditioners, which are thousands of times more <clears throat> powerful in their uh, uh, global uh, warming uh, the atmosphere potential than CO2. Their, their power as a greenhouse gas is thousands of times more, so a very small release of these refrigerants uh, is a big deal. And so they are collecting and storing that so it doesn't get discharged into the atmosphere. And um, with plans to roll that out into more cities. Um, and there are, there are so many fundraisers that have been, um, I just had a couple of two, for, two of them uh, as an example. Uh, one was for educating girls that um, we don't think about that much in this country, but um, having girls go through at least 10th grade is a major way to help down the road to achieve drawdown. And there actually are 62 million young girls denied education worldwide. So, um, Rescue.org, who's been working with refugee camps, saw this need um, as soon as they started building schools and realized that the boys may have been going to school, but not the girls, and um, have a program where you can donate to uh, pay for the cost, the materials, tuition, and even to pay the families for the loss of that um, free labor on the farm or in the shop. The other is uh, Forest Re Restoration restoration <clears throat> by EdenProjects.org. And there are a lot of organizations that plant trees, but uh, Eden has found a way to make all of the greenhouse work, uh, the, the planting, the distribution, all done by 
uh, people in that localities where the trees need to be planted so that it is an economic boost to those communities and all of, of that effort creates jobs as well as planting more trees per dollar than any place I've found. And they, they are going great guns. So now we get to the secret sauce. <laughs> and um, one of the first things is, as people learn about all these different climate solutions and, and begin to see one that calls to them and that they want to work on, uh, it's really critical to have an action plan where it's actually spelled out in black and white why you're doing this, what the impact is, um, who you're going to need to talk to, and actually what's the first step, what's the second step, and uh, what are you going to do by when. And this is the first step and it's going to be done by this date. Well, once that's done, what's the next thing to do? Well, it's this. Well, when is that going to get done? By what date? And actually having that all mapped out, black and white, on a plan. And um, it really elevates this um, pro bono work, you know, hobby, volunteer work, to something that's as important as you would schedule out and write down for something you're getting paid to do. If you're putting on uh, you know, a festival and you're getting paid to do it, you've got a written plan of what you're going to do when <laughs> and deadlines. And that's how you are successful with it. And so having that for the climate work is absolutely critical. And um, having it where you can see it not just doing it and putting it away, but really using the action plan to keep on track. Because, you know, there's always ups and downs and, and oh, well, they're out of town till next week, so let's change this date. And then I can talk to them. And just having that written down and sharing it with somebody, letting someone know, here's what I'm going to do by when. So the next thing I call action circles. And usually the, this comes from a group of people that are learning about climate solutions together and have kind of that common ground there. And the key there is, you know, five, six, eight people that meet on a regular basis who are all working on written action plans. Know how hard that is and can support each other when things get in the way, the car troubles, uh, the family coming to stay with you for a while, uh, problems at work, uh, sickness, all of those things that throw you off track and encourage you to get back on track, that know what that's like and say, it's okay, it happens to everybody, what are you going to do by our next meeting? And also to celebrate the successes and to have, have people that will cheer you on when you're actually able to uh, check off things on that checklist that needed doing. And um, this has been invaluable in all of these projects to have not only a team that's actually getting the, the composting done or the, uh, you know, the other, the other uh, climate solutions done, but also someone that you can say, you know, our team lost two people and we're trying to recruit or whatever. But uh, people that like you are really taking this seriously and really wanting to make something happen out in the world and to work at the community level. All of these uh, supercharged <clears throat> uh, initiatives were successful because they were working at the community level. And that's where you can really multiply your own individual um, actions. And so the action circle is the support group that uh, gets you through the ups and downs and is just uh, has made all the difference in making sure these initiatives actually get out into the world and are successful. 
even with the ups and downs and the changes and the pandemics and uh, everything that gets in the way, still being able to um, make it through. So the, the action circles, any kind of support group, sometimes it's just uh, individuals that are in communication. Sometimes it's Pachamama Alliance uh, communities, sometimes it's Drawdown communities, sometimes it's other uh, climate action groups, even a neighborhood group can act as an action circle and just supporting people in what they're doing. But uh, trying to do this all along, uh, it's just, I see so many people start and, and not be successful. And the people that have the support group of like-minded uh, individuals that are really there for each other. Uh, those are the places where I see it really supercharged. So uh, if you have not been to Project Drawdown's uh, website, drawdown.org, um, you know, I am not, and our group is not affiliated with uh, Project Drawdown in any way. And uh, we just encourage people to read the book and to go to drawdown.org and find a solution that speaks to you because we need them all. Uh, people are often wanting the one solution that's gonna solve everything. And you know, uh, you hear a lot of crazy claims about, you know, all we have to do is this and, and if everybody did it, then we wouldn't have a, a problem with our climate. Well, realistically, we need people working on all of the impactful climate solutions. <clears throat> there is no small solution. We need them all. And uh, some of them uh, lend themselves to this kind of community action better than others. But it depends on where you live and it depends on what's happening with energy in your area. And it depends on what the politics are like in your area. So, and people are working across borders. Um, there are you know, the food waste group was in Toronto. And uh, there are people uh, in Australia working on um, climate solutions. And people are getting on Zoom and talking to people in other countries, other parts of our country, about how best to get these climate solutions energized and to increase the adoption. And uh, so it's just a matter of really getting informed and doing the research and finding what really calls to you and finding your team, finding your support group and writing it down and really, you know, staying with that plan. So I see we have at least one question. <laughs> see where the Q&A. All right, worm bins. We just have uh, two options for the uh, worm bins. I have five that I have been, um, you know, as a colony is fed, it expands. And so I have uh, expanded now to where I have five worm bins for, for sale. And there's pandemic pricing there. Um, if needed, but we also have um, a um, worm bin workshop coming up that we're just getting advertised for the end of May, May 23rd. And so to get information on uh, either of those, uh, the email is kcdrawdown at gmail.com. I'll put that in the chat or in the Q&A. And uh, I'll give you a little background on the worm composting. Um, this was developed uh, in my second grade classroom that I was teaching because uh, mainly uh, to help the uh, students 
understand what a uh, decomposer was. And um, as a adding to the science in the curriculum, you know, I, I tried a traditional uh, worm bin and it was just a, a total disaster. And it was so complicated that I couldn't have the students touch it. And so I developed a simpler self-contained um, style of worm bin and my students could take care of it completely. I didn't have to touch it. And they were just amazed because on Friday they'd put food uh, in the worm bin and then on Monday they'd come in and check and it, it would have disappeared. And uh, you could have it in the classroom because it never smelled bad. And um, so it's uh, been really amazing to uh, have people have something concrete that they can do to lower their carbon footprint. And the key, I think, to having it in the kitchen is not only is it really convenient. I usually, when I get food scraps, pop them in the freezer. And then when I'm ready to feed the worms, I can pull it out of the freezer and, and feed them. But it's a conversation starter. That there have been so many conversations about reversing global warming and climate solutions. Um, from people looking at this five-gallon pail going, what is that doing in your kitchen? And, you know, you can increase the insulation in your attic, but nobody can see it. But something uh, like the kitchen uh, composting worm bin gets those conversations started. So, just to recap, um, find your solution and uh, learn more about it and write an action plan. What could you actually get done with help with a team in three to six months? And um, then, you know, find a support group to help you through the ups and downs. Uh, the worms in the worm composting are called red wigglers and they are just perfect for um, not only um, composting food scraps, but they are great in uh, Midwestern soil and are a real boost to uh, flower beds or vegetable gardens or lawns or any, anywhere you put them. And um, they just do a great job. Um, so uh, Sarah has several questions. Um, the Earth Savers is an action circle of people that study climate solutions. And uh, they just go from project to project. And it's kind of like, well, okay, we, we got that grant, what's next? And are just there to support each other regardless of whether they're doing backyard methane capture or what, whatever they're, they're cooking up. And um, so they may get involved with protecting um, public or private lands, but mainly it's working on climate solutions, knowing that that is going to uh, save us from the climate disasters uh, heading down the road. Um, and yes, uh, they would be a source for, um, you know, if you are needing volunteers to help plant trees uh, wherever, um, I can help get the word out at kcdrawdown at gmail.com because there are people with that uh, experience that would be glad to help. Hello, Dave. <clears throat> um, yes, I do not, I'm not, I'm kind of aware of the jumping worms, but um, like I said, that's not an issue with worm composting. Michael. Um, 
it depends on the colony for uh, most people. Um, our survey had them having about a cup a day of food waste and the worms kept up with it. And the key there is that um, uh, the colony needs about three months to really start getting um, up to where they will uh, be able to handle just about any food that goes in. And so uh, for the first three months, you have to kind of add food and then kind of check after a day, check after two days. And, uh, you know, it may be three days before it's gone and it's time for more food. That's the other good reason to put it in the freezer. But we're um, probably, uh, you know, some families have two bins because they have more food scraps than, than the colony in one five gallon pail can handle. So I hope that uh, answers your questions. Thank you all for tuning in.